Good morning, everyone. My name is Eli Storch. Off with a little bit of uh, static there, uh, but my name is Eli Storch. I'm the chair of the Design Advocacy Group. Uh, thank you for joining us today uh, for our August monthly meeting uh, with our friends from the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission. Um, one thing we're trying to do, uh, it's not the same as when it was in person, but we'd like everyone to introduce yourselves. So please jump in the chat, uh, tell us who you are, what organization uh, you're here with, um, and uh, any other pertinent facts about, uh, about yourself uh, this morning. Uh, appreciate seeing that in the chat, seeing everyone uh, introduce themselves. It's a, a little bit nostalgic to our time together. Um, and speaking of that, if, if you look at our recent e-blast and in a new e-blast, we are uh, conducting a survey uh, about people's preferences in terms of uh, in-person versus Zoom meetings uh, as they relate to uh, these monthly meetings, special events, uh, et cetera. So uh, if you see that, please fill it out. It helps us out. Uh, we really appreciate the, uh, the data. So look for that uh, when you have a second. Um, if you have any events, announcements, exhibitions, things coming up that you want to share with us, please put those in the chat as well. Uh, we'll try to call you out, ask you to unmute and tell us a little bit about uh, what your event is. Uh, we love to, to share those with our community here at DAG. Uh, so feel free to, to throw anything in the chat, share links, um, and, we will, uh, and we will call you out and let you, uh, let you talk a little bit about them. Um, any technical difficulties during the meeting, please reach out to me uh, here. Uh, I will do my best to help you uh, if I can, and uh, we'll try and uh, sort out anything that we can from the technical side. Um, I will say uh, typically our meetings have been off record when we were in person. Um, we've had the ability though with Zoom to record them and, and publish and share with a larger audience. So you saw that the this meeting is being recorded. And if you go to the events, tab on our uh, on our website you can search all of our past events going back uh, to September 2020 um, with a presentation on strawberry mansion and uh, I think the North Broad Renaissance was probably our first uh, our first zoom meeting so you can check out all of those there's YouTube links contained in those event links and you can uh, watch all the dag content uh, that that your heart desires um, so I think first off, Marsha, do you want to jump in here and uh, share a little bit about upcoming uh, upcoming DAG activities? And you're you're muted. All right, thank you, Eli, and hi everyone. Uh, we have another great program planned for Thursday, September fifteenth. Uh, Eric Devera uh, will be talking about Parking Day, which will be occurring the following day on the, six, the 16th. And if that's not enough, um, DAG will be reporting its progress on its Streeteries design guidelines. So um, we'll look forward to seeing you next month on the 15th. Eli. Yes, thank you, Marsha. We, will, we are looking forward to that. Um, this Streeteries progress with DAG has been uh, going back a good long way now. And we're excited to, to talk a little bit more about it, the, the progress that's been made, how we're setting ourselves up for the upcoming regulations from the city and what we're going to be releasing as soon as we see those, uh, those regulations coming out. Uh, David Brownlee, do you want to jump in and give us a few, uh, a few advocacy updates? Right. <clears throat> um, I think most of you are aware um, that the um, community outreach for the future of the Roundhouse, the police administration building uh, designed by Bob Geddes as a symbol of reform and associated because of its historical association with Frank Rizzo with other things, um, that the community outreach uh, uh, portion that the, uh, the planning commission is undertaking before putting the future of the, uh, of the Roundhouse out for bids is now underway. Um, and you can find the, the opinion poll um, that the city is using at, uh, at, at www.roundhousefutures.com. Uh, uh, yeah, it is a .com address. And um, so if you want to participate in that process, um, that, do that. Um, I've just put in the chat at the beginning um, a extraordinary uh, digital uh, uh, vision 
of the future of the Champs Elysees, um, uh, created two years ago uh, by a French architect named Philippe Chiambaretta, uh, who not coincidentally is serving as a consultant to design workshop, which is preparing a vision for the future of the Benjamin Franklin Parkway right now. Um, it's about an eight minute uh, digital uh, presentation, which I do really recommend that you take a look at. Um, if Philadelphia is actually going to, is actually going to transform the parkway, um, uh, we need a vision of what it will be that's really compelling. And this vision for the Champs-Élysées in Paris is compelling. In fact, it's so compelling that although it was not commissioned by the city, it has been officially adopted by the city. The mayor of Paris has, says that she aims to implement it. Um, it's, it's stunning. Um, so I take, uh, recommend that you take a look at that. That's, I think, the first item in the chat today. I think that's it, Eli. Wonderful. I just uh, drop that in again for anyone who missed that first uh, first link. Uh, you can see the Vimeo link there. Uh, George, do you want to jump in? You have a, a few advocacy items as well. Sure. George Claflin, one of two uh, vice chairs. Um, probably the biggest thing in, in my mind at the moment is the, uh, a piece on the university city townhomes, and we're meeting about that uh, within the next few days. And so there may be uh, a piece that comes out, an additional piece. There is already a piece on our website uh, right now about the townhomes. Uh, very serious issue. Uh, two issues uh, and, and, and mirror images of a very different character, Washington Avenue and Spring Garden Street. Um, we had some discussion as to whether we should have a position on Washington Avenue many other organizations already have staked out their positions. We are concerned, or many of us are concerned about the safety factors in the Western part of uh, the work where the street will be repaved basically to five lanes without much other uh, development. In contrast, Spring Garden Street has got quite a bit of money, including a recent grant uh, from the William Penn Foundation that puts them over the top and permits them to start doing the planning for making a trail linking boulevard essentially out of the uh, pretty nice right of way of Spring Garden Street that will link the Delaware trails to the uh, Schuylkill trails. Uh, so those are uh, among the many uh, things that are coming out. The, the other thing that we've been tracking and I think we might wanna do a piece on uh, is the uh, staffing level at the City Planning Commission has declined considerably and is now at the level of 32, or at least that's what's in the phone directory, which uh, certainly in my opinion is inadequate for uh, a city this size and, and, and complexity. Wonderful, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Obviously, the wonderful is for your updates, not for that level of, of staffing. Um, so we'll we'll follow up on that, and and there should be some advocacy around that coming up. I wanted to point out a couple of items in the chat. Uh, Sarah Hagee, thank you for sharing about the the Electric Expo 2022 uh, coming up out in King of Prussia. And Shannon also posted a link here to the New Gravity Housing Conference. Shannon, you want to unmute, talk a little about New Gravity. Hi, yeah, thanks. I appreciate the opportunity. So Green Building United is a real wonderful force in Philadelphia and its regions. And every year their Passive House community puts on this conference. It's totally virtual and it is tomorrow, but you can sign up right now from the link I threw in the chat. It is the only affordable multifamily Passive Housing conference out there. And the speakers are amazing. Uh, they're all from the East Coast this year. They're by invite only. And there's something for everyone from policy, health, workforce development, return on investment, you, you name it, monitoring, data. We, we've got some incredible experts. So please join us tomorrow. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for jumping in. Um, also wanted to point out, uh, Daniel Pascal dropped in the link to the Eastern PA Greenways and Trails Summit. Uh, September 26th to 28th. So there's a link there. You can learn a little bit uh, more about it. Um, as George mentioned, we, we've, we've been reaching out um, and hopefully we'll have some more on the Spring Garden plan in a future DAG meeting um, that we are, uh, we are checking in on and hopefully we'll have that uh, 
for everyone soon. Uh, SJ, if, if you scroll up in the chat, those links should all be, uh, should be visible to you if that's where you're uh, not seeing them, but uh, thank you everyone for sharing those. So let's jump into our, uh, into our presentation. Um, I'm gonna pass, uh, pass every, it over to George Claflin in a minute so he can introduce our speakers. I uh, just, please remember we will have a Q&A at the end. So drop your questions in the chat and we will do our best to answer them. Uh, and, and please stay muted as we, uh, as we go through the presentation. So uh, George, I will pass, uh, pass the mic over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Eli. Uh, the Delaware, uh, uh, first I'll start with the, the definition of the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission. They're, they're one of uh, quite a few federally designated metropolitan planning organizations uh, that are funded largely by the Department of Transportation, the federal level. Uh, in this region, they cover nine counties in two states, Bucks, Chester, Delaware, Montgomery, and Philadelphia here in Pennsylvania, and Burlington, Camden, Gloucester, and Mercer in New Jersey. And their vision is one of a prosperous, innovative, equitable, resilient, and sustainable region. And they are trying to achieve that uh, through uh, coordination and convening of the widest possible array of partners, uh, including individual citizens, government entities, and special purpose entities such as transportation authorities, and they're highly engaged. Today, uh, we're here to learn about their Connections 2050 plan that took four years of development. Um, but first, I want to just segue a little bit to uh, regional planning uh, as, as an organism. We're very lucky to have it in the United States because uh, the, the general uh, tenor uh, of, of the country is probably not so much pro-planning in many areas, but uh, transportation provides the motivation for a lot of planning because you can't really plan transportation without moving between different jurisdictions. And in fact, the purpose of transportation is usually to move people between jurisdictions. Uh, and I'm reminded of the first, someone who's credited with being the first regional planner, Patrick Geddes of Scotland, uh, who among other things uh, developed a, uh, or built a camera obscura in Edinburgh uh, to observe the Edinburgh region. And he is also credited with uh, having uh, defined the concept of the valley section that Ian McCart made a great deal of uh, use of in his work. Uh, the other person I'm thinking of is Kevin Lynch, uh, the great uh, urban design theoretician uh, who wrote uh, one of his most interesting books on regionalism was of course, the sense of a region or managing the sense of a region. So it's with this great heritage um, that, that we think about um, the, the role and mission of Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission. At Penn, for example, there are two departments that claim the name regional planning. Uh, the, the, the city, one department is the Department of City and Regional Planning. The other is the Department of Landscape Architecture and Regional Planning. And they both have great claims on that title and I don't think they're anxious to give them up. Uh, so we're, we're very, lucky, very happy to be able to uh, have our guests today. And they've done an incredible planning effort that was done under very difficult circumstances uh, during COVID. Uh, and uh, they have a, a vision for, uh, for of the future that they articulate in great detail. And uh, I will let them explain that. But first, let me introduce the, the principles here. Barry Seymour is the executive director of the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission. And he tells me that the first plan that he worked on here was the 2020 plan. And uh, I can remember working for uh, someone who was very happy about many years ago, of course, working on a plan for 2020 because it, it articulated with uh, what we consider to be good vision. Uh, the new direction, of course, is 2050. Uh, and uh, Barry uh, has a, a BS degree from Tufts. 
and an MRP uh, from University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He's also, in, in addition to being at uh, DVRPC for many years, uh, he has had a major role in the Association of Metropolitan Planning uh, Organizations, which is a national uh, convener of, uh, of, or of such organizations throughout the country, all of which have distinct regional characters, I'm told. Uh, and maybe we can get some comments on that. Uh, Brett Fusco is the Associate Director of Comprehensive Planning at DVRPC, and he uh, was the overall uh, co-author of these uh, of the plan. Uh, and he has uh, he's an expert, among other things, on scenario planning, about which you will hear quite a bit, I think, uh, during the presentation, uh, as uh, as it is part of the. Uh, a dispatches from the future uh, component of the plan. Uh, he, he has a BS degree from Wichita State University and an MCP uh, with an emphasis on physical planning and urban design from Penn. And Jacqueline Davis uh, was uh, a co-author of most of the, the plan and uh, has also managed the convening uh, uh, of the public and stakeholder uh, visioning process about which I'm sure she will explain more. She facilitates the futures group, which is one, one part of that uh, activity. Uh, and and she, she was the co-author of the dispatches from uh, alternate futures. Uh, she, uh, she has a BA in political science from Penn State and a master's in urban and environmental planning from the University of Virginia. And you're probably tired of hearing from me, so I will turn it over to Barry uh, to, to commence the presentation. Thank you very much for making yourself available today. Thank you, George, and thank you for that, that generous introduction. And uh, thanks to Eli for uh, having us on, on your agenda today. And um, thanks to all of you who uh, were able to join us. Um, so uh, I am going to kind of do a brief introduction on um, some context about the regional plan, why we do it, uh, where it fits in uh, to sort of a larger uh, portfolio and, and set of activities that we're responsible for, but also how it could be used uh, more broadly. Uh, and then I'll turn it over to Brett and Jackie to take you through some of the details around uh, the policies of the plan, um, some of the strategies and our investment portfolio because um, the, the plan, um, you know, as I say, planning without action uh, is just a dream, um, but action without a plan is a nightmare. So uh, we, we try to tie all that together. Uh, next slide, Jackie. So uh, I wanted to give a little bit of an introduction to DVRPC. I know, you know, I see some, some longtime friends uh, on the call today that probably know all about us and probably some folks that really don't know, know all about us. Um, DVRPC is not necessarily uh, a household word uh, or, or entity. A lot of the, the work that we do is um, kind of direct service with our member governments um, and we support them in that way. But George touched on it, but I'll just take, uh, take uh, flesh that out just a bit. Next slide. So uh, the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission uh, was created as a bi-state organization with legislation in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. And uh, we always laugh that, that our, our initial mission in that legislation was to plan for the orderly growth and development of the region. Um, and uh, in a region like this, that's probably an impossible task, but it's one that we've been trying to, uh, to advance ever since. Um, as George noted, um, once the federal government created the MPO, the Metropolitan Planning Organization System, whereby every uh, city um, of, of a medium and large size throughout the country has to have some sort of regional organization uh, to, at a minimum, coordinate transportation investment. And um, I say at a minimum because um, you know different regional organizations are engaged in different activities in different different cities, um, and uh, as are we. But we all share at least at that minimum that role of coordinating transportation investments. 
So if transportation is at our core, we know we can't do transportation planning without understanding development patterns, without understanding um, the, what's on the ground in terms of our natural resources. Um, we've gotten more and more involved in, in more recent years on uh, sort of broader sets of issues around different topics. We're currently working on a strategy around um, housing um, and, and accessible and available affordable housing across the metropolitan area. Uh, we are now the uh, agency responsible for coordinating uh, economic development for the U.S. Um, Department of Commerce uh, and are engaged in a variety of other, other activities um, that we can talk about later, perhaps. Um, but, but at our core, and what we really want to focus today is um, our long-range plan. And uh, we see our role as developing a regional vision uh, that can not only guide our investments here, but can serve as a, uh, a touchstone for, for uh, the full metropolitan area. And it's a, a large, complex, diverse area, uh, everything from, from Philadelphia out to rural Chester County or the pine lands of, of Southern Burlington County. So a lot of different interests that, that, that we try to tie together. And then that long range plan uh, feeds into and becomes the, the uh, basis for our capital investment program. Uh, some of you may have heard of the TIP, uh, which stands for the Transportation Investment Program. Uh, the TIP is the capital program of all federal investments across our metropolitan area. Um, they cannot proceed uh, unless they are recognized within the TIP. So the TIP becomes um, Kind of the organizing framework for investment. You know, I sometimes describe DVRPC as a, a cross between a government agency uh, in that we have this, this responsibility under federal transportation law to serve as this metropolitan planning organization and develop the plan and the TIP. Um, but really the bulk of what we do is we serve as a consulting firm. Uh, working for our member governments. And just for example, today was mentioned uh, the Spring Garden Street um, Greenway Corridor and Washington Avenue. Um, we provided uh, planning services for the city of Philadelphia. We did a study uh, designing uh, some of the improvements around Washington Avenue. Uh, we provided grants uh, to the city for plans both on uh, Spring Garden and, and Washington. Uh, and I see Patrick Starr on the call was very involved in the Spring Garden Street uh, plan. Um, and uh, we provided funding uh, for Spring Garden through, uh, through the TIP. So um, that role as a government agency providing capital funding, a consulting firm uh, whereby we do the studies and a foundation where we provide grants to uh, our members or others um, to, to do work uh, that helps to advance the plan. Uh, next slide. So this is our board structure. Uh, we have 18 voting members, nine from each state, uh, and about a dozen non-voting members. Uh, the board gets together uh, 10 times a year, um, and they are our uh, over, uh, overlords, our, our decision-making um, uh, body. Uh, it includes three representatives from each state, including the, the commissioners of the Departments of Transportation, representatives of the governors, and another state ag agency, and then uh, six local members on each side. And that consists of four counties uh, from each state and two cities from each state. So in New Jersey, that's the city of Camden, the city of Trenton. In Pennsylvania, it's the city of Philadelphia and the city of Chester which you might ask why Chester, and that's because back in 1965 when the DVRPC was created, the city of Chester was the second largest city in our five county region. So uh, continuing to today, uh, the city of Chester is a voting member on our board. Next slide. So here's just a snapshot of uh, both a map that you can see uh, the geographic area of our region and kind of a snapshot by the numbers. This metropolitan area is almost 6 million people and 3 million jobs. Uh, as I mentioned, we're nine counties in two states with four cities. Uh, within those nine counties are 352 local governments. Um, 
uh, as most of you know, um, there is a strong uh, local government uh, control within our region, meaning each of those 352 municipalities has their own um, local zoning code, their own planning boards, their own decision-making structure, and are largely responsible for uh, development and land use within their own jurisdiction. Um, our job is to, best we can, try to tie those together, try to make investments that can um, either support or uh, incentivize growth uh, in appropriate areas. And uh, these are pre pre-COVID numbers, but uh, within, again, within our nine county area, about 100 million vehicle miles traveled per day, 100 million vehicle miles traveled per day, and over a million transit trips per day, although we're, we're not back to that yet. Um, next, please. So, you know, a, a key role and a challenge, I guess, for any planner um, is to try to reconcile uh, what's on the ground today uh, where the trends seem to be taking us and our vision for where we'd like to go. And uh, sometimes there is that delta between where the trends are going and, and where, where we'd like to go. So uh, our role is to try to articulate um, why uh, a, a preferred vision or, or is uh, advantageous for everybody. And then uh, how can we bend the trends? How can we change um, patterns over time? You know, and as George mentioned, I've been at this a long time here. Um, and, you know, uh, I did work on the year 2020 plan. And, and now that 2020 has come to pass, we, we were able to do a little bit of a retrospective, um, see how the plan recommendations from back then line up with, with uh, the, the 2020 in reality. And um, you know, we've seen a lot of successes uh, back in, if you think that year 2020 plan was done back in 1990, uh, a time when Philadelphia had been losing population for decades and all the growth was in, in the center, in the suburbs. And um, you know, what we've seen in the last 10 or even 15 years, uh, the, the highest growth has been in Philadelphia. Uh, now that doesn't mean it's the end of the suburbs and um, you know, there's still a lot of land and a lot of interest and a lot of market um, to go still in, in our suburban communities. But I think we're finding a much more balanced uh, pattern of growth in our region now. And um, we're, we're trying to do what we can to invest, uh, not just in Philadelphia, but to support growth in uh, centers throughout the region. And if you think of places like Westchester or Media or, or, or um, um, that even smaller places like Downingtown or um, Glassboro, New Jersey or Bordentown or any of those smaller, uh, smaller boroughs, um, we want to encourage growth and, and support uh, infrastructure in those areas. Uh, next slide. So uh, the heart of the plan is around transportation, as I mentioned, that is the federal mandate, uh, but we've chosen to take a much broader, much more comprehensive look at uh, the region and at how transportation connects us. And um, while it's not uh, always the um, uh, sufficient um, driver of growth, it's absolutely a necessary driver of growth. And by encouraging uh, different forms of transportation, different communities and giving people options um, that can really um, lead us in, in a lot of good, good directions for what we're, we're trying to achieve here. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over, next slide to, to Brett Fusco. Brett has been our um, manager of the long range plan and uh, he and Jackie will take you through the vision, strategies, policies, uh, an investment portfolio, and then hopefully we'll have plenty of time for uh, your your feedback and some discussion on the backside. So, Brett, all yours. Thank, thanks, Barry, and good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm going to focus on the vision and strategy section of the plan, uh, including some of the background analysis and public outreach we did to inform uh, this portion of the Connections 2050 plan. So in each update of the long range plan, something we have to do every four years by, by federal mandate, uh, we undertake a collaborative planning process. Uh, and this process uses scenario planning and regional indicators 
amongst other things, to understand the trends and forces shaping the region. It then uses this information to inform our regional visioning, uh, as well as to help us identify strategies to help achieve that vision. Uh, we, we shape all of our long range planning efforts around public engagement. We also build tools like our municipal implementation toolbox, which identifies strategies that local governments can use to implement the plan and decision making tools like our multimodal project evaluation criteria that analyzes uh, the benefits and trade offs of different transportation projects relative to the plans, vision and goals, all as ways to help bring about the vision. Uh, we also do some work to help to evaluate our planning process. Uh, as part of our effort to continue to learn and improve. Uh, Barry mentioned uh, you know, we do uh, scenario planning uh, to help us to help us uh, you know kind of think about the future and what the future could be and, and you know think about the future not just as a you know projection of, of the recent past but but one where nonlinear trends and forces can shape it to be something completely different than than what we know today. And so uh, you know, for a variety of reasons, when we when we look out into the future, it's it's certainly a bit cloudy. So I, I like to use this cloud shape to kind of represent a, a you know a, a range of, of plausible futures that, that could come to pass. Um, so you know we can we can think of kind of an infinite number of futures within within this uh, shape. Um, but most planning processes uh, don't don't function this way. Uh, they typically are looking at a singular vision of the future. That's whether they're looking at an aspirational vision of the future they want to bring, bring about uh, or a most likely future, which may be less aspirational, but, but kind of a, a continuation of, of recent trends. Um, they also tend to sweep a lot of our uh, you know, kind of assumptions about the future and uncertainties under the rug where they're, where they're kind of hidden away and, and we're not thinking about them. Uh, so exploratory scenario planning is a strategy that helps us to see better into a range of, of probable futures uh, by assessing uncertainty within a changing environment, uh, understanding what conditions or events may emerge along with their likely consequences, uh, identifying potential actions to respond or uh, benefit from these uncertainties. Uh, this helps to bring a lot of our assumptions about the future to the forefront, test them out in different ways, our goal is not to predict the future, but to get a better understanding of how it may play out as well as of different nonlinear trends or future forces. Uh, and we really need, you know, as wide ranging a variety of future scenarios uh, to cover as much of this uh, cloud of uncertainty as, po as possible. Uh, this can help us to gain a much broader perspective on what the future could look like and, and be more prepared for when and if it looks uh, different from today. Uh, so our current scenario planning effort, uh, you know, worked in, in, in all, you know, in our most recent ones, we've worked with an external stakeholder group uh, called the Greater Philadelphia Futures Group that we facilitate. Uh, and uh, that group is made up of, of a variety of, you know, stakeholders uh, from, from various uh, academic and, and policy experts down to anyone from, from the general public. It's an open group, uh, anyone who's interested in participating and being a part of our scenario planning is, is, is welcome to do so. And we'll talk later about you know, how, you could, how you could register and, and uh, you know, be informed of, of this process, uh, which is something we're about to, to update um, right now. It's, as, as I mentioned, we're a four year update cycle, which means we're kind of constantly talking about the current plan while also looking to the future and thinking about the next plan. But um, you know, back to scenario planning, uh, a key part of our exercise is to identify which forces are likely to have the greatest impact on the region uh, and where there's the greatest uncertainty around those future impacts. And so for this uh, Connections 2050 plan, the Futures Working Group really zo zoomed in on, on three primary future forces where we focused our attention. Uh, the first being the digital revolution where technology is reshaping the economy away from industrial era production and toward the creation of information and content. And you can see um, kind of across the top, the technology side of, of, of one of these forces or as, as a force. Um, and then uh, the access on, on the left hand side has our other two forces, uh, one which being rising inequality, uh, which limits the just and fair inclusion in a society where everyone can participate, prosper and reach their full potential. And, and climate change, which is the result of rising levels of greenhouse gases trapping uh, heat in the atmosphere. So we, we use these forces then and, and the uncertainties within them uh, to, to think about you know, what different future scenarios could look like for the region. And so um, that's, that's then shown here. I'm not gonna get 
Uh, I'm not going to cover them in depth. I'll, I'll point you to the report that we produced for this uh, here in a moment. Uh, but but really, the uncertainty around these were, you know, will technology change incrementally over the next 30 years, or will it be transformative and to where you know te technology change will take us to places where where we, you know, almost probably can't even begin to envision today. Um, and, and then the second half, you know, we we combine climate change and uh, inequality, which we see as collective action problems. And that's where the uncertainty really lies in those is are we going to be able to somehow take grassroots effort or public effort around uh, reshaping uh, both both of these issues to, to you know, tackle them head on, basically. Uh, I, and, you know, I mentioned I'm not going to go into these scenarios in detail, but I, I would just point out the bottom two are, are not particularly rosy futures. And I think this is another you know, difference from from scenario planning, from a lot of of uh, you know planning that we tend to do um, in, in the urban planning field, and, and that's you know look at you know potential futures that aren't aren't ideal or you know putting on rose colored uh, tinted glasses to to think about you know what we want the future ultimately to look like, and this helps us to really understand you know some of the systemic risks that are out there, um, as well as opportunities that that help us respond to them. Uh, and so, you know, as I mentioned, uh, you know, the scenarios were we 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 actually use them in two different reports. Uh, the kind of more accessible, wider ranging report called George mentioned is called uh, Dispatches from Alternate Futures. Uh, it, it's really a series of news articles about the future, trying to help you know understand what each of those different futures could could look like. Uh, has a kind of covers a range of issues, not just transportation, but environment. Uh, economy, climate, uh, you know, we, we basically finished writing this report in February 2020, and then the whole world changed. So we tried to throw in some very last minute um, breaking news coverage around COVID-19 uh, as we were as we were doing the, the design and layout of it. Uh, we did a second more technical report called Preparing Greater Philadelphia for Highly Automated Vehicle Deployment. Uh, this, this looked at uh, really use those same scenarios to look at how automated vehicles may or may not deploy uh, in, in the region over the next 30 years. Um, we, we certainly aren't 100% sure that, that that's gonna happen. I think there's still just uncertain, general uncertainty there. Uh, but we also took a broader, new, broader view of how the transportation network could evolve in the future in each of these scenarios. And, and part of that evolution being you know, decisions that we're all making today uh, and, and you know, kind of what's the general vision that we're working towards. Um, and not just DVRPC, but the region as a whole. And I think, I think what we've tried to always account for in, in these scenario exercises is, is have them not just purely be documents for DVRPC, but really to be documents for the region to, to use and think about. Um, the scenario planning helped us to inform our, our visioning workshops. Uh, so I, I have here some kind of direct quotes that we heard um, in, in our series of workshops and, and you know, through a web survey. We also did a series of community conversations where we uh, reached out to, we targeted and reached out organizations around um, equity and environmental justice issues around uh, youth, uh, which has always been a, a group that we, you know, I feel like have missed in our long range planning, uh, as well as um, uh, the business community. Um, we categorized, you know, the, the thousands of comments we received. Uh, we we use them, we use those categories to help us uh, to define you know, uh, set up the, the vision, which I'm going to show you here in a second. Um, but we, we definitely heard uh, a, a lot, obviously, around transportation, being a transportation agency. Um, we heard a lot about equity um, in, in addressing income disparities, which, you know, to a certain extent goes a little beyond our purview, but is certainly something that we're all very interested in. Um, the, uh, we, we heard a lot about the regional economy, uh, because this happened as COVID, as COVID was really kicking in, and you know we had a whole set of in-person outreach that we had to completely redesign at, at the very last minute to, to move online. Um, we we heard a lot um, about you know the COVID impacts of the economy and rebuilding uh, you know, post-COVID, which we're still not quite there yet. I've heard a lot about um, needs for more education within the region. Uh, we've heard a lot about climate change, sustainability, and resilience. Um, and you know, I think the thing that maybe kind of surprised us a bit it was it was it was probably the newest thing we we really heard about. It was a lot uh, about um, kind of you know small d democracy and, and engagement was was 
yeah, I think I think a topic that was new to us in terms of being a big uh, component of our uh, outreach and what we were hearing back. Um, so we took you know the cat we took those comments, we categorized them, uh, and, and we used that you know what we heard to um, write this vision statement for the region: um, an equitable, resilient, and sustainable Greater Philadelphia region that preserves and restores the natural environment, develops healthy, inclusive, and walkable communities. Uh, maintains a safe multimodal transportation network that serves everyone and grows an innovative and connected economy with broadly shared prosperity. Breaking that down a bit, there's, there's kind of a lot there, even though I, I think we, we kept it pretty short and compact. Um, it's really built around three uh, core plan principles. Uh, the first being equity, which we defined as the just and fair structuring of society where everyone can participate, prosper and reach their full potential. Uh, this also includes accessible civic engagement that gives everyone a voice in public decision making uh, with a particular focus on communities that have historically been marginalized and disenfranchised. Uh, resiliency, which is uh, planning in advance to reduce the vulnerability of people and infrastructure to hazards and emerging threats such as extreme weather, pandemics and recessions, and the ability to quickly recover from threats and ha hazards when they do happen, and sustainability. Uh, which we define as the ability to meet the needs of today without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs and making policy and investment decisions that incorporate environmental, economic, and social considerations. Uh, there's also then four focus areas, the first being the environments. Uh, and, and for each focus area, we have a, a series of, of related goals. Uh, your Greater Philadelphia is already uh, a leader in protected open space. We have uh, 633, 100,000 acres of permanently protected agricultural lands, forests, and parks. And we've set a goal in the plan to permanently protect 1 million acres by 2040. Um, carbon emissions have declined regionally between 2010 and 2015, which is still the, you know, the most recent years for which we have data. Um, plan sets a goal of net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Uh, the plan sets a vision to build more ecological communities by designing with nature. Uh, the plan aims to increase local production, distribution, and access to fresh, healthy, and locally grown foods. Uh, and the plan works to improve air quality, water quality, uh, by noting that the most important air quality improvements will also help to reduce greenhouse gas emissions since they largely come from the same sources, the burning of fossil fuels. Uh, the second uh, focus area in the plan is, is around land use and communities. Uh, the plan aims to focus uh, growth and development around uh, 135 development centers spread throughout the region. Uh, these are focal points in the landscape, which have the necessary infrastructure to support additional jobs and people. Uh, this will help to create more vibrant communities that enhance the region's walkability, bikeability, and transit service. Uh, the plan also envisions the development of a more racially and socioeconomically integrated communities, enhancing community schools and amenities, uh, including the development of an 800-mile regional circuit trail network and the preservation of historic resources. Uh, our region has long played a deeply important part in the American story and is something we should do a better job of telling. Uh, and telling that should include also the bad parts of, of our history. Uh, DVRPC is primarily a transportation agency, but as, you know, as we noted early on, transportation connects us to everything else. Uh, from the transportation vantage point, we know our infrastructure is aging and too often in a state of poor condition. Uh, there are plenty of opportunities to update and modernize as we repair our existing infrastructure. Uh, the plan intends for every transportation project to enhance safety, walkability, bikeability, and access to transit. Uh, this is a key to achieving a Vision Zero goal of no transportation fatalities or serious injuries in the region by 2050. Uh, integrating modes into a mobility as a service network can go a long way toward reducing the need to own your own vehicle in order to have uh, access to mobility and reliable transportation, which is needed to participate in our world today. And transportation, as transportation digitizes, uh, we will need to do more in the realms of security and cybersecurity to ensure reliability and safety. Um, our last focus area is around the economy and, and transportation still remains very critical to the digital economy. Um, as we've seen e-commerce rise, rise, we're also seeing increasing truck volumes that go with it. Um, and so even though people spend more of their days at work moving around, uh, physical movement of goods and services is still as important as it ever was. Uh, we need to make sure that we have the workforce skills to, we need to prosper in the digital age while greening our economy, uh, to respond to climate change, building the small businesses that will drive the region's future, uh, making sure that we all 
are connected to a broader global economy and with more broadly shared prosperity. Uh, we worked a lot on strategies uh, for Connections 2050. Our, our previous long-range plan, Connections 2045, had about 245 strategy recommendations. It was really kind of, they were all spread all over the place. Uh, so we tried to consolidate them and at least give, you know, a few key strategies that, that really help us to, to recommend, uh, you know, to, to, to present our recommendations within the plan. Um, so you can see this, this table here shows 15 the 15 key strategy recommendations in there, they're, they are very high level. We, we break them down uh, more specifically for each, uh, but uh, they, they all are intended to be consistent with the plan's uh, principles of equity, resiliency, sustainability. Um, they are also shown by the focus area. We've added a fifth focus area around regional planning. Um, I will note quickly on uh, number 13, be prepared to adapt to a range of plausible futures. Uh, we've identified some more adaptive strategies. So, so these are strategies that uh, really respond to the specific scenarios that were developed. Um, Think about if, if this happens, how should we respond? Um, some of those recommendations uh, may be not beneficial or even harmful in, in other futures. So hence, hence the need to be kind of strategic uh, in, in pursuing those sorts of recommendations. Um, and then I also wanna highlight just for this group, I think I thought it was important to highlight this uh, strategy number five, design new and celebrate historic high quality walkable neighborhoods. Um, this strategy uh, included something that we haven't done a whole lot of, some, some just kind of general urban design recommendations. Um, it also then included some more specific strategies around reducing parking minimums and improving parking management, adaptively reusing underutilized buildings and designing new buildings for potential adaptive reuse. Um, use creative placemaking strategies and programming to animate public spaces for diverse audiences, protecting historic resources, uh, creating a vision to develop more parks in underserved areas, and prioritize existing parks investments in maintenance, in, in maintenance and uh, strengthening neighborhood schools' role as community and social centers, uh, using local land banks, uh, code enforcement, and other means to fight blight, decay, and abandonment. And uh, for each of our strategies, so uh, in terms of strategy number five, we tied the we look to tie back kind of the most relevant set of, of three goals every time, and so that's uh, that's where this uh, this strategy ties back into, uh, but it does tie into other goals as well. So I, I'm gonna at that point kind of at this point stop, uh, pass it on to Jackie. She's gonna talk about uh, strategies, some more about strategies and funding. Yeah, thanks, Brett. Um, if you can just stop sharing your screen, then sure. I can share from my end. Thanks. Um, so yeah, Brett, Brett gave a great uh, overview of how we got to our vision and policies and, and then the strategies. And the next step in our planning process is the investment decisions. So our vision and goals are set, uh, they set our ideal, but we can't afford everything that we want to do to implement that vision. The planning process, so we analyze and prioritize projects based on the vision and also the need that exists. So in the Pennsylvania side, for example, the plan allocates more funding to transit at 24.4 billion than it does for roadways at 23.5 billion. Um, and there's um, uh, uh, the greater disparity on the uh, New Jersey side for what we need. And overall, we can only identify about 44% of the funding that we need to achieve the vision. So strategy 14 um, uh, that Brett uh, showed in a couple of slides earlier is decision-making that supports the vision and goals of the Connections 2050 plan. Uh, and we use a project benefit evaluation criteria to make those decisions. We use uh, metrics for um, some of the different criteria and we weight them uh, in, in different ways that you can see here. Um, and uh, our planning partners, uh, our counties and the cities that we work with to develop the financial plan uh, help us to set these weights and the goals and the metrics. Um, and this is what we use to evaluate each individual project to see what we're actually going to fund with the revenue that we have. So before funding individual projects, we fund project categories in a way that aligns with the regional vision. This chart here shows the cost of the vision plan as the sum of each bubble here uh, represents the cost of $1 billion. 
And the greatest needs are identified as system preservation uh, on the roadway side, operational improvements, uh, and expanding bike and pedestrian infrastructure. The filled in bubbles are what we can afford out of the vision and identify how we've allocated the reasonably available revenue to different categories within the vision plan. The lack of funding leads to some tough decisions, particularly on the Pennsylvania side of the river, uh, on the bottom side of these estimates here. So the plan focuses on maintaining existing infrastructure, allocating nearly three quarters of available roadway revenue to system preservation activities. Uh, it greatly expands the vision for bike and pedestrian infrastructure. Um, the plan aims to increase the amount of revenue going to standalone bike ped projects with 4% in Pennsylvania and 5% in New Jersey, and around 13% of funds are dedicated to safety and operational improvements um, on both sides of the river. And it's worth noting that the plan allocates more funding to standalone bike ped facilities at about $9.9 billion, .9 billion dollars, as it does to roadway system expansion. Um, which uh, is just below that. And um, the system expansion category does have a hard cap at 4% uh, uh, of roadway funding available. Other projects include a range of mandates that need to be funded, though these are the smallest budget in the plan, roughly 3% of available funding. Uh, and in addition, nearly every project in the Transportation Improvement Program, or TIP, uh, that Barry and Brett mentioned earlier, has safety, bike, and pedestrian components, uh, as does um, the category like roadway preservation and operational improvements will, will include those components as well. So this slide details the vision plan by project category for the transit side of our plan. Uh, and here the greatest investment need uh, are system expansion, just like the roadway side. Um, uh, I'm sorry, system preservation, just like the roadway side. And uh, for transit, we do um, have a, a larger vision for system expansion. And here's a slide um, of how our limital, limited available revenues are allocated to each of the project categories. So about two thirds of available revenue is going to system preservation, about 5% to operational improvements and 18% to system expansion because there's no cap on the transit side. And close to 20% will go to other. Um, and for transit, the last category includes major expensive like trackage fees uh, for the use of Amtrak owned and operated facilities. One of the last steps in the plan is to select the major regional projects for inclusion in the plan uh, based on the policy and our fiscal constraint. Uh, and these are only the big projects in the region. So we have carefully defined what constitutes a major regional project in our planning documents. Um, and there'll be thousands of other projects that are smaller than that, uh, typically smaller than $25 million that are funded over the life of the plan and they're programmed in the four year tips. Um, and we have an interactive web map um, that uh, there's a, a screenshot of it here in the link as well. Um, and they show these projects and more details about them on the website. Some of the projects included in the plan and funded in our long range plan are the King of Prussia Rail Project to expand a spur of the Norristown High Speed Line to King of Prussia. That's funded in the plan and will open in the later years of the plan. And with continued investment, the circuit trail network will be a network unlike any other in the country. It will connect urban, suburban, and rural communities with dedicated non-motorized rights of way uh, separated from vehicular traffic. So right now, Pennsylvania has $6 million programmed through 2026, and that doesn't include the Spring Garden Greenway that Baron uh, and Brett mentioned earlier. And on New Jersey, we have 24.8 million dollars program through 2031 and an additional 227.8 million dollars is budgeted for the i-95 at penn's landing uh, facilities so the vision is completion of the remaining 267 miles of the circuit in pennsylvania and remaining 179 miles of the circuit in new jersey for a total of 561 miles of the circuit trail network wow. Since the adoption of the plan, the IIJA or bill funding has become available and the impacts of this funding has most recently been illustrated in the adoption of the uh, fiscal year 23 Pennsylvania tip. Funding for the DVRPC regional highway program and transit program in the FY23 tip is the highest it's been in recent memory. 
A total of $1.8 billion in highway and bridge funding is available to the region over the four years of the TIP. And that's a $486 million or 37% increase when compared to the financial guidance in the previous TIP. There is an additional 200 million or 550% increase in funding for bridge improvement projects. Uh, and the region's receiving over $30 million in additional funding for safety projects and 24 million or a 150% increase for bike ped projects when compared with the previous TIPS financial guidance. Prior to the passage of the IJA, the region was faced with the decision to delay uh, push out from the tip into the later years of the long range plan or remove entirely over $750 million of funding from existing projects. And this would have been on top of the $1.1 billion of construction funding for existing projects that was delayed during the uh, FY21 tip update. But after the passage of the IJA, all current existing projects are funded, no cuts have been made, and projects are available to advance sooner. 12 new roadway uh, projects are funded, an additional uh, estimated cost of $91.5 million, and 36 new bridge projects at an estimated cost of $256.3 million were added to FY23 TIP. Uh, and projects that had funding pushed out to the long range plan during the last TIP um, are able to advance at a level of $303.8 million. Um, and sorry, I. I was reading all that before I put it on the screen, but there it is for you. Um, most funding is available through IIJA though is competitive funding, so grant-based. Uh, and some of the programs uh, that are available here are infra, um, infrastructure for rebuilding America, Nas MEGA, uh, National Infrastructure Project Assistance, RAISE, Rebuilding American Infrastructure Sustainably and Equitably, uh, NAVI, National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program, and NOLO, or No or Low Emissions Bus Program. So there's um, updates that come out on a regular basis. Um, they're called Notices of Funding Opportunity Updates, and there's a link here for you to sign up uh, for those updates. DVRBC also has uh, an FAQ page on all of these funding opportunities and provides consultations for potential applicants. So there are links here that um, are available to you for signing up for both of those as well. So in addition to technical assistance, um, the Municipal Implementation Toolbox is another resource DVRBC offers to local governments. DVRBC, um, we designed the MIT to serve as a guide for municipalities to help implement the goals of the Connections 2050 plan. And so there are, there's a tool online that has uh, nearly 80 individual tools that can be filtered uh, by principles and focus areas in the long range plan. And each individual tool has a page that contains resources, case studies, ordinances, and uh, indicators for each. Um, and the tracking progress indicators is one thing that I did want to highlight here as another tool available uh, on DVRPC's website. This is an interactive dashboard for exploring regularly updated data to gauge the progress of Greater Philadelphia as a region toward realizing the principles of the plan. And the data and tracking progress is also valuable uh, as a resource to other planners um, or planning professionals, um, analysts, architects, um, or anyone interested in the conditions of the future of the greater Philadelphia region. So um, at this website here is an interactive page that um, you can check out all of the data for each of these different indicators. Um, so all of this information and more is available within our two planning documents. There's first the policy manual, um, that's the 2050 plans primary document, which contains the vision, the principles, goals, policies, and strategies, and a, fun, uh, a summary of the financial plan. Um, and then it has a more technical companion report, the process and analysis manual on the right, which contains uh, supporting information related to the vision and strategies, along with the detailed financial plan, including project lists. So more information on those documents, um, as well as all the related tools is available at dvrpc.org slash plan. Um, and lastly, I just wanna share a couple of ways to stay involved and up to date on the plan um, and its related committee, committees. Um, so you can sign up for plan emails, um, sign up for futures group emails and, and participate. We will be doing another scenario planning exercise this fall to inform the next long range plan update. 
um, follow DVRPC on social media. Um, and here are uh, mine and Brett's emails um, related to the long range plan. And uh, all, of, all of our emails here are listed on our last slide, which we're happy to share with this group. So thanks very much. And uh, I think we can pass it back to George who I think will facilitate some questions. Thank you very much, Jackie, Brett and Barry. A wonderful presentation. Um, yes, I have some questions. I, I, and I hope our audience understands just how radical some of this planning has been. And I, I wanna foot, I wanna highlight that. One of the signposts listed in the uh, dispatches from the future for the delayed expectations, which is sort of the negative future, says political polarization is entrenched with sudden and rapid swings between political extremes. Um, other, other, this is a warning sign that that's the, the scenario that's happening. Another is limitations with technology lead uh, to an, a new AI winter. Uh, I think that it's you, you probably have to look pretty long and hard to find a municipal or county planning organization that would have the, the courage or the mandate to say such things to its own, uh, to its own government. And I think uh, DVRPC deserves a lot of credit for taking the uh, initiative to say that not all the futures that we can imagine are entirely rosy and that one of the motivations for planning is indeed to try to avoid uh, some of the problems that we can see forming uh, in our world at present. And on that score, I'd like to ask you uh, a question about how this has been received by local governments and the press. It seems to me that the press has been less than um, uh, excessive in in their in their publicity uh, about this. Maybe they maybe it's too complicated. Uh, and then uh, we know that one local jurisdiction uh, ended up abstaining on this plan, uh, despite its its enormous uh, uh, emphasis on sustainability. And um, maybe you could give us a little more. Um, uh, characterization on that on that score. Sure, I can I can start on that and then Jackie and Brett can give give their perspectives uh, as well. You know, so I think as as I mentioned in 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 my sort of first comments, the DVRPC board is a pretty diverse group of of folks. Um, everything from from Philadelphia out to um, some of the the suburban even more rural um, parts of, of our metropolitan area. So, you know, they're carrying different perspectives to the table and, and that's to be expected. And, and kind of our challenge is to find, um, find a common ground. Uh, ultimately, this needs to be adopted by our full board. This is not just something that's prepared by staff. Um, so it, it's a, a, a cooperative effort uh, to find that middle ground. Um, that being said, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you saw Jackie's slides that there's a, a finite amount of money that that can be allocated towards projects. Um, and we try to do that in a policy framework, um, even before we get to projects to develop that policy framework of where the priorities are. So, um, you know, that that 4% allocation for new roadway capacity. Um, it is very much a, a negotiated figure. Uh, I can say that sort of representatives from city of Philadelphia felt and as would probably others, maybe even those on this call today, feel that we should not be investing any money in, in new roadway capacity and that all the money should be going, you know, to support transit investments and, and others which were, were, were also heavily invested. Um, you know, at the same time, we have representatives from, from Chester County or, or some of the more uh, suburban counties that are very much car dependent, you know, communities there now, as much as we're trying to build uh, higher density there, as much as we're trying to support uh, new forms of, of transit or other, other options. But the reality on the ground uh, is still that it is primarily 
uh, car dependent and, and some of those uh, facilities are old that, that need, need reinvestment. So there's this wide range that we're trying to find, you know, walk that, that, that narrow path through the middle that, that works for everybody. I think at the end of the day, Philadelphia felt that maybe there was too much investment on, on the roadside, despite our significant investment in, in transit and support for SEPTA. So um, that they, they, they chose to take a stand there. Um, you know, not everyone gets every project that they want. Um, so, you know, there, there are lots of projects that are identified in the plan, but are unfunded just because of those uh, caps on, on available funding. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, we work closely with the city of Philadelphia and, and they're, they're a good partner. Um, they felt they needed to take a stand to, um, you know, abstain for voting on the plan, but I don't think that takes anything away from uh, their ultimate participation in, uh, in the process and in um, working with us on future allocation of funds. So, um, you know, that, that's um, the road that we have to walk. Um, but um, I think we're, we're um, you know, that, that process, we're all in that together. So uh, they know that and, and we know that. A question came in on, on the Broad Street subway and um, the, uh, the first question, I'm gonna combine these two questions. One was about extending uh, the Broad Street, uh, encouraging DVRPC to push hard for extending the Broad Street subway into the Navy Yard. The second uh, was again on the Broad Street subway, uh, commenting on uh, the current discussions related to the Roosevelt Avenue, Roosevelt Boulevard uh, extension of the subway. Um, can you contextualize either of those, either or both of those projects uh, for us? Sure, and, and I'll let, let Brett and Jackie jump in here as well. I mean, the, those both of those projects are examples of where we were heavily engaged as a consultant uh, with the city. Uh, we did the ridership forecasts for um, extending the subway to the Navy Yard. Uh, we're, at, we're now actually funding a uh, autonomous shuttle, uh, which will serve the Navy Yard and, and uh, the, 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 the end of the Broad Street line. You know, part of the challenge of the Navy Yard is you, you punch a line straight through wherever it lands, you're still a mile away from development on either side. So, um, you know, this autonomous shuttle will be, I think, one step towards that. Um, you know, Roosevelt Boulevard, we've also been very engaged over the years and kind of led the, the planning to establish some new um, uh, direct bus service, uh, some, some express buses to increase that. But, um, you know, either of those projects, a new subway to Navy Yard or uh, a new subway on Roosevelt Boulevard are um, extraordinarily expensive. That doesn't mean they're impossible, but um, they're, they're still in, in planning. Brett, Jackie, you guys want to pick up yeah, on? Yeah, I, 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 I do want to just jump in and I think you know those are great questions I think you know in an ideal world we would we, we wouldn't have to even pit any of these projects against each other but in, in a funding constrained world that that sort of happens I, you know also you know the way the current federal legislation is is transit doesn't compete on equal footing for for federal for federal dollars really the only way to, to use federal funds on on transit expansion is is through through the uh, new starts or small starts programs and you know those those are very competitive there's not a lot of money in them every year and and they only pay you know i think the, I think the average uh, grant amount is only paying about 40 percent of the project costs right now so you you need the other 60 percent of those costs need to come from local sources and you know we we don't have those local sources so that's that's been one of the, the huge challenges for for bringing transit you know expansions into this region is is finding that local match and you know, right now the the state law doesn't even allow us to to collect any sort of revenue to to help fund local transportation projects. Yeah, I mean, what well, well, one thing I'll I'll add is, um, you know, before the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which um, I hate, we we before we we were able to say Ice T and Fast and Map and you know, this not a good way to say I I J A, but um, you know. 
SEPTA's backlog of investment just to maintain the system that they have today uh, was over $4 billion. So, you know, as Jackie showed, SEPTA is getting an additional $100 million a year on, under, under the new law, which is terrific. They need it and, and we'll spend every penny of it. Um, but that's a long way to fill a $4 billion gap. So, uh, and that was, of course, pre COVID. You know, now, now their ridership is even more challenged. So, um, you know, the bulk of their money will need to go to maintain the system. Um, right now, they're very engaged in uh, thinking about rebuilding the trolley network, which is, is kind of at the heart of the system, redesigning uh, the bus network, uh, thinking about existing regional rail and how that can serve the region better, uh, including a lot of areas in the city where regional rail trains run by but don't stop. Um, so they're being very cautious and, and understandably so about significant new investments and significant new capacity. Um, you know, the King of Prussia line is something that had been in the works for uh, planning for, for a long time. Uh, right now, I think that's the third largest uh, concentration of um, jobs in the region after uh, Center City and University City. Uh, it's virtually unserved at all by transit. Um, you know, folks from, from that live within the city have to take a series of buses and long, long trip to get out there. So they're still proceeding with that, but I think, you know, you can understand why they're, they're being a little bit cautious about committing to significant new capital projects right now. Because the other point is the IAJA is a five-year bill and there's no guarantee what happens at the end of those five years. I have a question here on how the business community can better engage uh, to help shape better outcomes for our future. Um, you know, that's a fair, fair question. I think, you know, sometimes the, the, the business community is not always a monolith um, in, in terms of how, how they, they think about or represent the region. We work closely with the chamber. Um, at various times, the chamber has advocated, uh, for example, for more state funding um, to, to support uh, regional investments, and, and that's really important. I mean, the, the chamber um, what was supportive of some of the safety improvements, such as the uh, red light cameras and speed cameras on Roosevelt Boulevard, which have had a, a terrific um, impact on, on improving safety of, of that road. Um, you know, sometimes it's hard because the business community is so broad and so diverse to pick projects specifically um, in that each business may have their own uh, specific needs and, and, and priorities. Um, but, but I think that recognition of the need for, for investment um, to support regional growth and support the economy um, it is probably at the core of, of what, where we could use um, business community support. Also sort of more broadly around um, uh, sort of broader issues around sustainability, around energy investment, um, energy portfolios as that relates to uh, emissions and, and climate change um, and, and certainly around um, issues of opportunity and equity um, which you know maybe is the half step away from the transportation, but is very much at the core of our um, uh, our planning goals. One example of that that actually comes to mind as you describe it, uh, Barry, is the Hilco uh, site in Philadelphia, a uh, huge site, and uh, you know some people have been hoping that it would become sort of like a new town in town. Other uh, people would see it as a, a new center for biopharma research and related activities. And some of the early proposals seem to focus on big box of uh, uh, warehousing and distribution activities, which um, while sort of somewhat ne necessary in our new lifestyle seem less exciting. Uh, and this of course is totally within the uh, city of Philadelphia. So uh, I'm sure the city claims uh, uh, a prior authority here, but do, do you have any 
comments on such a big project? Um, I've been talking a lot. Maybe I'll give Brett, Brett or Jackie a chance at this one. Um, you know, I, we're, we're following it, we're tracking it, um, and, and watching the watching what's going on with, you know, with with how it's how it's moving forward. Obviously, there's there's a lot of concerns there on just you know the, the pollution from the refinery days. And I know they're they're cleaning that up, but you know that that if if, if it were going in a residential direction, I think I think that would be something we'd want to pay a lot of attention to in terms of you know what what are those you know residual health health concerns that might come from putting housing there. Um, but I'm thinking of the the you know the articles about all the lead pollution that they're finding in 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 Philadelphia from the historic uh, you know days of you know the heyday of Philadelphia in a way from all the, the industrial activity that, that used to happen um, and, and still does but maybe not 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 in the same way that it did. Um, you know obviously a site that large, you know, we're, we're expecting at some point there's going to be some some call for transportation projects to go there. Um, we didn't talk about too much in our presentation, but we have to do um, uh, employment and job forecasts for the region to go out to 2050. And so, you know, we we this time did a you know worked with each of our counties to develop a pipeline of of projects that are out there, and this is just one of, of many. There's there's a lot of big projects out there. And I think, I think the, the thing that really stood out was how much warehouse and, and uh, you know, kind of, uh, low, uh, what's the right word? I'm, I'm, uh, like light manufacturing space is being developed in the country. I think if, if everything that's in the books out there were to come to fruition, it's about 90 million square feet, if I remember right, off the top of my head, across our nine counties. And, and this is one of, of many of uh, projects, and, and it really speaks to the way e-commerce has, you know, shot up at least in the in the immediate aftermath of the pandemic. Um, it, it seems to have kind of calmed down since then, but the demand for for warehouse space has not necessarily calmed down. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's something we're we're studying, particularly that e-commerce question right now, um, and it's not surprising given the location. That, that's there, that there's so much interest in making that a, a logistics, a freight and logistics center. I have a question here, a data question, uh, and I'm gonna give a, just a brief introduction to it because I made a telephone survey of the, uh, or telephone directory survey, and I think you have about 110 employees right now uh, at DVRPC, but with vacancies, you may have an even larger staff, which makes you, three and a half to four times the size of the Philadelphia City Planning Commission uh, staff, which is probably the next largest planning organization in the, uh, in the region. Uh, and your data services are legendary. And I know that occupies a significant amount of staff time and, and therefore money. Uh, the question here is, does DVRPC measure the region's existing modal share for sustainable transportation modes? And, and the person qualifies it here as not just for commuting, but all travel. Set goals for increasing that percentage and measure progress on that in order to increase equitable access to local needs and advance the region's climate action. Yeah, yes. So, oh, go ahead, Jackie. Uh, so um, I'm not sure we do this for all travel, but we certainly measure mode share for uh, commuting. Um, that's one of the indicators on our tracking progress platform uh, that we track, in addition to vehicle miles traveled. Um, so those are things that we do track over time. Um, and in terms of setting goals for increasing the mode share of the more sustainable um, modes, we do have goals for integrating modes um, and modernizing your infrastructure, um, as well as increasing mobility and re reliability. Um, and, and as I mentioned earlier, we do have a cap on system expansion. So, so while it's not an explicit goal for increasing mode share uh, of transit that's in the plan or, or bike pad that's in the plan, we're, um, we're supporting um, the use of those um, 
facilities by investing in them. So, so that's, in addition to that, we also have a net zero goal by the year 2050. So um, those are the ways that we're supporting the um, non-single occupancy vehicle uh, modes. And, and, and Bretter, um, Barry, maybe, maybe there is a way that we're measuring uh, non-commute travel um, by modes that, that you're familiar with, I'm not. Yeah, so, so you know, the, the, the traffic um, uh, information is sort of a combination of uh, counts on the ground and, and we, we lay tubes to count cars and we also uh, put uh, lay tubes uh, or have automatic counters on a lot of trails throughout the region uh, to count bicycle traffic. Um, so, so we have, have sort of hard data on the ground in ter terms of, of uh, you know, vehicles and, and bicycles and pedestrians. We also have a separate set of counters uh, that we use for, for pedestrian counts. Um, we then rely on um, other data sources that are out there and a big one now, the fact that, that everyone uh, sort of has one of these, uh, which gets, gets tracked and counted as it moves around the region. Um, so we're able to get data on um, sort of uh, activity movement through cell phone data and how cell phones move around the region. And then finally, we have a, a pretty sophisticated regional model uh, which sort of is ground truth with that data, but then is able to uh, sort of project more broadly around um, traffic by mode um, that, that's then used both on a project basis and on a regional basis. So a lot of that data is available on our website, George, as, as you noted, um, by counts, traffic, um, traffic counts, um, sort of other, other information is all available um, on our website. There, there is actually also a, a federal requirement that we um, set targets for future um, non-SOV travel by commute mode share. Um, that one, that one's been a bit hard, tricky because the pandemic has, has really reset that. They, they do count in their working from home as non-SOV travel. You know, I guess not technically travel, um, but that that would be one that that actually is way up. Um, what that looks like two, three, four years down the road, though, is a little harder to project as we, as we hopefully move out of this pandemic at, at some point in time. Uh, a follow-up on this is, uh, is, it, uh, is the, uh, Daniel Pascal is asking, uh, who was the author of the previous question, uh, what is our target for non-SOV mode share? A non-single occupied vehicle mode share, do, or do we have a target for that? We actually have two targets, and I, I don't remember them off the top of my head. I, I think we we set them above where they were at pre-pandemic levels, but below where they are currently. Uh, just uh, there's so much uncertainty out there, and there's actually um, not necessarily. Uh, punishments for not making your targets, but um, it, it adds a lot of paperwork and work and, and kind of just administrative headache for not making your targets. But, uh, you know, it, it is getting um, us to, to, you know, coordinate uh, a lot more around, you know, target setting around around things like how do we how do we increase non SOV travel, which I think is, is a benefit um, to all of our work. Um, and you know, so we, we they, are, they are set by urbanized area, if I remember correctly. So it's the Philadelphia urbanized area that we set one target for, and then it's the Trenton urbanized area that we set a second target for. Um, I believe the Philadelphia one's quite a bit higher. Uh, it might be around 30%. The Trenton one's around 15%, but those are, those are kind of off the, off the top of my head type recollections. And those are annual, those, those get reset, I believe every year. Those, those are every year targets. So they're very short term. And a question uh, circling back to the, uh, some of the introductory uh, things with where, where we, I mentioned Kevin Lynch and um, to a lesser extent, Patrick Geddes in this regard, urban design and visual character. Uh, I, I, I mean, again, one would imagine that this is jealously guarded by uh, the local jurisdictions, that their authority in, in, in visual design, urban design, and uh, such things is, is, is uh, probably pretty important to them. 
but I know that you're interested in it and uh, you have some backgrounds in it. I know Brent has a background in it. Uh, can you comment a little bit on where you might go with that, say, in the next plan? I'm, I'm thinking years ago, I, I, I mean, I've, I've been here long enough to see changes, whether they were completely intentional or planned or not. But in, for example, in, in Admiral Wilson Boulevard, as you coming off the uh, uh, Ben Franklin Bridge uh, was sort of a hunky tonk zone and is now uh, sort of a, a dead passive zone. Uh, I'm not sure one's a total improvement over the other, uh, but it's probably more resilient at least to flooding in the Cooper River. Uh, but that's just an example. So we um, we have a, a land use map um, that we use for um, uh, for evaluating our transportation projects, and we've used centers in the past. Um, so that's where we're uh, targeting some of our or indicating that we want to target uh, some of our development, and we are reevaluating our, our centers. Um, with different land use typologies at the moment. Um, so that will probably inform um, where we are directing transportation projects and other types of, of investments to go. But that's kind of uh, an ongoing process that we're just getting off the ground right now. Um, we just finished the first year of our four year planning cycle. Um, so we have three more years of, of development to go. So um, if you ask us two years from now, we'll probably have a better uh, more clear answer for you, but um, that that is something that we can talk about. Yeah, and and just as I noted, you know, outside of Philadelphia, there are 350 local governments, each with their own autonomy around um, development decisions. Uh, we have a funding program to support. Um, action at that local level that helps to implement the plan. So we've given out a number of grants to many of those communities with, that are doing work either to upgrade their zoning or to sort of improve the character of those communities. So that's one way we can sort of try to influence what, what's happening in those smaller communities. I see that my colleagues, David Brownlee and Eli Storch have turned their cameras back on. And I think this is a subtle, uh, indication that maybe we're running near the end of our time limit. Uh, I had, there's no more questions in the queue. Uh, I urge our audience to consider going on the DVRPC website and downloading uh, data and plans and uh, enjoying uh, the tremendous amount of work that has been done. And on my behalf, I wanna thank you very, very much for uh, the hard work that you've done over a long, long period of time and the hard work you did in preparing for this presentation. Uh, so I'll turn it over to uh, Eli at this point. Yes, for, for anyone who would like to uh, turn their camera on, we do our, our, our quiet virtual uh, applause at the end of our presentations these days. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. It, it really was a wonderful presentation and, a, and an enormous amount of, of work to share. So. Uh, we thank you for joining us and, and George, thank you for, for the questions and, and moderating. Um, so we'll be back uh, in September. That'll be up on our website shoot soon on September 15th, uh, which will be an evening event uh, where we're going to get into the streeteries um, the day before parking day. So come talk about public space, whether it's restaurants, whether it's parklets, uh, and then go out on Friday and and see some wonderful uh, parklets uh, for parking day. So thank you again. Everyone enjoy your Thursday and uh, we will talk soon. It's Wednesday, enjoy your Wednesday. <laughs> We're usually on Thursday. <laughs> talk soon. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much.